Staying up to date with IS Networld, browse, and Aveda. Everybody's three favorite words that makes their life easier with updating information, as well as filling their inboxes with notifications to renew your insurance, fix your safety programs, etc. Et so today, we're going to discuss these three contractors' compliance websites, as well as um, any other webs there's there's other websites like this but for now these are the top three um, and we're going to give you a little bit of an inside scoop of basically what they're there for as well as um, allow you to take advantage of the opportunities with them so as mike said my name is cameron boots and i'm the director of risk engineering with allied insurance brokers and really what i do is i lead our risk engineering team um, to perform duties like um, contractor compliance, website maintenance with our clients to provide new solutions in the crane, rigging, heavy haul, in the scaffold space. So a little bit of an outline of what we're going to cover today. So contractors compliance websites, what are they? So, I mean, you look at, I, was, I, I just picked this up, but you look at the, the titles in the logos here, browse ISN Innovetta, and you look at their you look at their like their their trademarks, building the connections that build the world, collect, verify, and connect, the right fit. So basically, what what you're seeing here is yeah, it, it takes a while to upload information, but connection is the big word that's standing out as far as um, connecting with new opportunities, new contractors and new clients. And um, we're gonna, we'll get into that a little bit later. So why become compliant? We're gonna discuss why you as a company wanna become compliant with the people that you're working with. What documents are you specifically going to need to become compliant? Once you have those documents, what is required with these websites to become compliant? And then finally, what are the benefits of utilizing this? What's the benefit of these being the right fit for you? So first and foremost, what are they? So ISN, Aveda, Browse, and even you get into some of the other ones, ComplyWorks, PEC. So they're third-party compliance systems that larger companies, larger contractors, larger energy companies utilize to pre-qualify their contractors. The reason that they're doing this and they're utilizing websites and software like this is to really transfer their risk and their exposure, their liability, onto a separate party to conduct this. So very similar to like when we when we talk to you about insurance or when you're when you're bidding a job, you transfer risk in some instances as well with a rental contract. So very similar to how you're transferring risk with a contract or an agreement that's what these big companies are doing to basically transfer the risk onto these compliance websites to make it their responsibility to pre-qualify you the contractors and subcontractors so why become compliant with these websites why why not fight them why not hold out be the rebel in the group and honestly they're becoming a requirement. So becoming compliant because they're becoming a requirement. So if you haven't come across them yet, odds are you could be floating under the radar in a specific, working in a specific industry where it's not necessarily relevant, but it is becoming more and more relevant within the industries that contractors are working in. So right now, they're biggest within the oil and gas sector the electric side, as well as the wind sector, as far as where they got their start and where they're most pertinent. So if you if you're right now, if you're thinking of like, let's say you're a contractor and you're looking to potentially get into these fields, oil, gas, electric and wind, and you're not using these contractor compliance sites, I would say, I mean, in my opinion, I would get registered with these with these sites. I'd pre-qualify with these sites. So when you're ready to bid a job in those sectors, you're ready to go because, I mean, 
how how soon can a job come up let's say 48 hours away and you're bidding it let's say you're not registered on these sites yet it could take a little bit about a little bit of time to do that so a good strategic risk or a decision to make is you know what i'm going to get i'm going to get registered with these sites and get ready before um, before it's too late so that's really why you want to become compliant so let's get into what documents you're going to need for ISN, Aveta, and Browse. So the first set of documents that you're going to need are three, the past three years of your OSHA 300 and 300A logs. Um, every, every company is, should be doing these and every company should be posting the 300A logs every year. So it's something that you should have on hand. And honestly, I recommend keeping these very accessible, maybe on your desktop, because whether it's one of these websites or just a contractor in general, they usually ask for them. Now, the reason I have starred new companies is new companies aren't necessarily going to have three years of OSHA 300 and 300 A logs. So, I mean, what are they to do? Are they just not going to get work through these contractor compliance websites? And the answer is they still can. They just, we gotta, we gotta take some extra steps to get them compliant so that the contractors recognize that, hey, they don't have this and here's why. So just more of that explanation to do that. The second documents required are in relation to your experience modification rate. The number that's based off of your workers, comp workers compensation um, line of insurance. I mean, everyone knows if it's above one or below one, everyone knows, I mean, it's, it, it's a number that contractors are, are judging most contractors off of. So we're going to get into, with with these, we're going to get into these a little bit more of, let's say there's a specific situation where your experience modification rate is above the requirement, what can we do? And we're going to get into that specifically within uh, OSHA logs, the EMR, as well as well um, as well as the other documents. Safety programs. So everyone everyone has seen that has, has utilized ISN of Ed and Browse, and I'm sure many of you, I know a lot of you on here right now are already utilizing these programs, but they all know that you can't just submit safety programs, they gotta get reviewed and they gotta give a RAV score as well. Um, the, the other document that's required across the board is proof of insurance. So a certificate of insurance, as well as specific endorsements to that job that we'll, we'll get into pretty, uh, pretty heavily in that, in that section. Then finally, depending on who the client is, client-specific documents. Let's say that you're doing a job that requires um, orientation before you get on site, turning that in specifically, and that might not necessarily be relative to your other other company, other companies you're working for. So it's just specific to that client. So first and foremost, your OSHA 300 and your OSHA 300A. So your OSHA 300 is the document that you fill out where, okay, we had a recordable incident here, and the OSHA 300A is the summary of it all. So basically, the info, we're gonna go over the information that these contractor compliance websites pull, and really the first one is recordable incidents. Do you have any recordable incidents? What are they specifically? So really, I mean, we'll do a little bit of an educational setting, and if, if you guys have any questions, or if you've had any issues with your 300 logs are getting them approved, please contact us anytime. Uh, we'll walk through your current situation and we'll, we'll, fix, we'll fix whatever we can. But a recordable incident is considered anything above and beyond first aid. So if you get a, if your guy gets a cut on a job site and the foreman gets the first aid box out of the, uh, out of the truck and is able to clean it out and put a bandaid on it, that's not considered a recordable incident. Let's say that exact situation, you take them to Med Express, and let's say that that doctor prescribes medication. At that point, it is a recordable incident because that is above and beyond first aid. So if he goes to that Med Express, if he's prescribed medication, if that doctor performs something beyond first aid, it's considered a recordable incident. So the formula and the calculation that IS Networld Event and Browse are going to utilize for recordable incidents is called your TRIR, your total recordable incident rate. 
So basically how they come up with that number to judge you off of is they take your total number of recordable cases and they multiply that by 200,000. Now 200,000, OSHA is using that as the average hours worked by a company in one year. So you multiply the recordable by 200,000 and then you divide it by the number of man hours that you had that year. Now I know a lot of you are thinking, two, OSHA's average is 200,000 hours in one year. You might be working 10,000 hours, 20,000, 30, 40, 50,000 hours in a year. So you're well below that average. So if you notice, if you're putting these pieces together, one incident could put you over the minimum requirement to work on a job site just because you have less hours than the average. So you're thinking to yourself, wow, I can't, if I, if I get an incident, I can't work on this site. So we're going to go through some solutions on this. If your total recordable incident rate is above that of, of how we help our clients get past this and solve this issue. So that's the first, that's the first piece of data they pull from 300 and 300A. The second, which is starting to become, they're starting to focus on this a lot more is your days away from work. And the reason why they're focusing on this more is a lot of a lot of companies weren't focusing on this themselves. Their guy would get get injured and he'd be away from work, and they're just they're focused on running a company, not necessarily how long that guy was away from work. So it, he could start to rack up 30 days, 45 days, 60 days into OSHA and these compliance websites. They're viewing that as that must be a pretty substantial injury if he's been gone that long. So now they're starting to calculate a formula based, based off the days away called your DART rate, which is the days away restricted time rate. So basically how they calculate that is they take the number of cases that in, involve days away, they divide that by your total number of man hours, and then multiply that by 200,000, which is OSHA's average. Now, one thing I highly recommend, if you, on your OSHA 300 or 300A, if you have a substantial amount of days away listed, give us a call so we can we can walk this through you just because um, we've seen a lot of situations where we've been able to help as far as that, and we'd be, we'd be more than happy to help, um, help you with your 300 logs. So the last piece of data that they're pulling from these are your total employee hours. So that's going to, that's going to really determine those rates the most. And then that's also, that can also be tracked and confirmed through site tracker. If you're required to issue, put your monthly hours in each, each, each month. Um, so a quote that I utilize when conducting or completing OSHA 300 and 300, 300 a reports for clients is a good accountant is always necessary. So just like you're going to hire a CPA to do your taxes because they might know something that, hey, you get a deduction here. Hey, you don't have to put this here. A certified safety professional with 300 logs and 300, 300A is definitely most desirable because it's just finding things like, hey, you don't have to put this here. And again, we'd be more than happy to review this for you. So the next piece of information that's required that we discussed is your experience modification rate. Now your experience modification rate is based off of your workers' compensation policy. And it's really derived from uh, your amount of payroll, your amount of claims paid out, as well as your total insurance premium. Now every state's going to have a different weighted exposure. And then you're also, depending on your payroll and size of premium, you're gonna have expected losses. Now, once they calculate that, they're going to spit out your experience modification rate. And that's going to be judged off of three years of your company history with workers' compensation. Now, the most recent year is not calculated within your experience modification rate. And a, a big reason for that is, is let's say you have an injured employee and you've paid out um, workers' comp to him, and it's not necessarily your company's fault. And within that year, your workers' comp carrier is going to subrogate against another carrier and get that settled. So that amount of loss isn't going to go on. So it gives your, it gives your carrier and your workers' comp state a, about a year buffer to, to figure that out to get that fixed before that goes on. 
Now, we mentioned new companies with the OSHA 300 and 300A logs. It's very similar to, okay, I haven't been in business for three years, so when I start out, am I going to have a mod? The answer is no. I mean, it could take one year. It could usually take three years, depending on when you get, um, depending on your workers' comp state situation, to be issued that mod. So, being again that this is a requirement and you don't have one, this is something that we can assist with to take extra steps to still get you approved within these contractor compliance websites to be acceptable to work, even though you don't have the experience modification rate yet. So, usually a big, this has probably been the big judgment factor for the past 30 years within the construction and the um, the oil field and the energy the energy sector is if it's above a 1.0, that's where they're going to start to question it. So usually that's where a lot of the ISN contractors say they'll red flag if it's above 1.0. In some areas with some contractors, it's above 0 0.9, 0 0.85. But when that's flagged, that's when this is going to be brought up, and that is where um, that is where you're going to need to provide a little bit of an extra game plan explanation to get approved. Um, so that's experience modification rate. The next requirement, like we said, safety programs. So you're not just required to put your safety manual into IS NetWorld Browser Nevada. You're required for it to be and to contain compliant safety programs that are improved, approved by these uh, websites. Now, Depending on who you're doing business with, I've seen them require as little as seven compliant safety programs, and I've seen them require as much as 50 compliant safety programs. Now, you're, the question you should be asking is, how should I approach that? So there's a lot of there's a lot of third-party safety companies that have put together manuals in the past. And they just threw together all 50 programs into one manual and said, here you go. You submit this. It's going to be accepted no matter what. If they pull out the seven, they pull out the 25 programs or the 50, you have them all. So just use it. And companies have started to use it. Our opinion, don't take that approach. Because what's that? what that is going to do is let's say you have all 50 of those safety programs in your manual. In your business, in your area of operations, only covers 20 of those programs. And those other 30 programs aren't necessarily covered. You leave yourself open to the exposure of, let's say, if you're ever in a deposition and there's an incident, an opposing counsel starts questioning about the safety program on specific cons confined space of African cave dwellings. And your worker laughs and says, I've never heard of that. And he goes, well, it was in your safety program. So if you don't know that, how can we rely on you to know the rest of it? So when it comes to building safety programs, our approach is start with the minimum and add as you need to. And even let's say specifically you do a job that ha that requires a one-off safety program. Yeah, implement it. Make sure your guys are aware of the of it. Have them sign off. But let's say you're done with that work and you don't you don't utilize that safety program anymore it's no problem to take it out. And that's usually a recommendation that we have. So keep this minimum based off of what your guys are required to do instead of just going above and beyond with the safety programs. So next requirement, proof of insurance, a certificate of insurance for all of your clients to make sure that you have the coverage required. So about every 30 days before your insurance renewal, you're going to start to get email notifications saying, hey, Update your insurance for this con contractor. Update this. Update the insurance for this contractor. Stuff like that. You're going to get that every week. What we recommend: get your insurance broker or us involved with helping you with that. So we spend a lot of time on these contractor compliance websites, and we've even contacted these websites directly to be listed on their key brokers list, so you can assign us access. To be able to help you and that what that allows is for our service team to go in review the insurance requirements and then once we do that we issue the certificate and we get that approved i mean there i'm sure a lot of you have heard the situations of issuing 30 different certificates and them just hoping hoping a certificate sticks 
to get accepted. So when we review it, we'll make sure it gets accepted the first time and we'll be, we'll have your back as far as um, making sure that you have the right coverage according to that contract. So the insurance requirement review is huge and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but just because you have coverage that it says on a certificate doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the same on an insurance policy. So we're going to get into that a little bit later, but in summary, have your insurance professional review everything that you're doing on IS Network. And last but not least, the client specific documents, um, the orientation training, the site tracker hours, the specific stuff that's, you're going to, if, if you're required to have client specific documents, you're going to have to stay pretty up to date with that contractor to make sure that they're done because also it's now their job to approve it, not necessarily IS Net World. So staying in close contact with them will be key. Okay, so now you have all of those documents, you're ready to submit them. What do you do now? First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna answer the questions required. So you could have 200 questions to answer, and you can have up to 1,200 questions to answer depending on the scope of work that you're doing. The biggest thing that I recommend is those documents that you are going to submit, make sure they match the answers of any questions associated with them when you answer the questions. Because once you answer the questions, then you're going to upload documents. Now, they could ask questions depending on like how many employees are you going to have, who's your designated safety professional, and then they could be asking questions of how many hours did you work last year. If that doesn't match your 300 log, it's going, the RAVs verification is going to red flag that and then you're just going to have to go back and redo things and that's just it's just a, a cog in, in the in the process of getting getting approved so once you answer the questions and upload the documents you're going to submit for review now these all these contractor compliance sites specifically even for the safety material they have safety professionals that work for them that are going to be reviewing those documents for you. Now, when you submit it, it takes up to a week to do. That's what it says. It's like, this is going to take up to a week to review. So if you're thinking, let's say that you are trying to get a job in by Friday and it's Wednesday and it just tells you that we're going to take up to a week to review this. And you're like, oh my gosh, well, what's going to happen? So one thing that we do and we can't, we, 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 um, we keep a relationship with the safety professionals of these sites is we're going to stay in contact, follow up and make sure that they can they can get this uh, if, if they can get it expedited well they will but we, we stay on top of that to make sure um, make sure that process gets handled. So once you submit to review, you get a grade, let's say you have an A that doesn't mean you necessarily have an A for the entire year. You have to monitor and maintain. New insurance requirements might come out, updates for safety manuals, they might require new things. So monitoring and maintaining is going to have to take place on the account. So we went over the documents that are required and we went over what is required to become compliant. Now let's get into some hiccups in some areas and also some solutions to fix those hiccups. So what happens when all of that is all everything submitted and your recordable incident rate is not acceptable or what if your experience modification rate is above one your safety programs aren't accepted your insurance isn't being accepted does this mean that you are out of work well it could maybe but you still have an option Specifically, if let's say your safety material, if, you're, if your total recordable incident rate is above their requirement and you only had one incident, is that necessarily fair? Well, eh, yes and no, but what we recommend to satisfy unacceptable information is just like how you work with a, certi or a certified public accountant to do your taxes, work with a certified safety professional with any issues with IS Network. The reason I say any safety professional will do, 
but our team, we we have certified safety professionals on staff. I'm a certified safety professional. And when we go to plead your case or your game plan and explain everything straight to these contract compliance sites, we notice it, it's held and it carries leverage in that situation with those other safety professionals. So the other thing that helps is working with a third party for this, specifically because they read between the lines and IS Networld says, wow, okay, if they're willing to hire a third party to assist them, they're, they're, it looks like they're willing to improve, so it looks, it looks very well. I'm not necessarily saying you can't do all of this internally, but it's just like uh, as a company partners and hires professionals to do their, their niche focus. So it's, it's, an option, it's an option to take advantage of. So examples of third party is your risk engineering team with your, of your insurance broker. So our risk engineering team is very up to date with this and we work hand in hand with our service team on the insurance side to make sure that you keep an A or you attain an A with an IS net world or specifically even a safety consultant. So I recommend if you've had any issues or you're not getting approved with ISN or any of these compliance websites right now, Shoot, shoot us an email, shoot me an email, give me a call to go over this and we can put together a, a report to submit to IS Network, Aveta or Browse. So we'll go into the details on that call because everything's specific to the client, but it's going to basically insist of an explanation and a game plan as well as put, putting controls into place specifically for you. Um, we've had this work about 96 to 97 percent of the time depending on who the contractor is unless it's just like a let's say a nuclear naval facility that's just no questions asked that's yeah it might be difficult there but not impossible it's worth a shot next insurance requirements let's say you get the hiccup of your insurance was not accepted within let's say the contract requirements have your broker review this have our service team review this because this is huge. Whether or not it gets accepted off the go or not, doesn't mean you're always in the clear. An example of this, let's say ISN requires a million dollar combined single limit for general liability as well as a million dollar combined single limit for auto liability. And they also require an excess liability policy to sit over both of those lines up to 5 million or even 10 million. When you look at a certificate of insurance, it's going to list that general liability for a million, auto liability for a million, and then it's going to list the excess liability for 5 million or 10 million, but it doesn't specify that, oh yeah, this policy sits over both of those. It doesn't necessarily always do that. So that could get accepted with an ISN, but that doesn't always mean that it's going to be right. Because if an incident happens and that becomes breach of contract, that becomes a whole different area and also a, a door that could be opened from an opposing counsel within a deposition as well. So anything like as far as breach, breach of contract, if you have any questions on that or want more information, get in contact with us and we can, we can definitely go over all of that. So we went over the requirements, how to get compliant. Um, specifics of how we can help from our risk engineering team and our service team. So what are what are the benefits to these con contractor compliance websites? Honestly, me personally, I think they're great. I do. I think it, I, it, it does take a little bit more time, but once you have it up and running and you're using it to your advantage, it makes things easier for bidding jobs as well as is gaining new opportunities. So really it streamlines processes. So let's say a client requires that your, all of your training programs need to be updated for all, all employees within IS Network. So you do that. One thing that ISN is going to do is it's going to notify you when that training expires. So it just streamlined the process to track training. Um, keeps you informed. It lets you know when you've been approved to bid this work or go on site or that your insurance is coming up. So it, it notifies you, it keeps you, keeps you in the light as well as works with your insurance broker to, to update and maintain everything. 
Third, this is this is one of my favorites, and it's um it's pretty interesting to think about. But gaining market exposure, marketing exposure. So I'm sure a lot of you on your websites at the footer, you put IS Network, you put Browse, you put Aveda. That's appealing to a lot of big energy companies, construction companies, large contractors, because that basically means, hey, these guys have already been approved by our systems. We're ready to go. That builds a level of, com of comfort with them. So it's a great opportunity to take because you went the extra step to get pre-qualified. And then finally, review and verification. So you're going to be entering in employee hours as well as depending on if you have an OSIP or a CSIP through IS Network, you're going to be putting in payroll specifics. So this is a great way to review and verify. Let's say if you ever if you ever have an audit that hey this was verified by IS Network, so you can go off of that. And they say yes, correct, boom. It makes that easy. So those are the benefits now. We have um, some questions that have been asked, but my biggest recommendation, if you don't have my contact information already, get in contact with me about specifics on this because these contractor compliance sites aren't going away and they're only going to increase within what you see. So any questions of how to really take advantage of these opportunities, please just call like call us discuss this with us we'd be happy to put together a game plan so you don't necessarily have to spend your time thinking about this but you you could put that on to us and you can spend time doing what you do best in running your companies so questions yeah we have a, a small handful of questions here cam um first one is how do you get is net world or browser veta to accept uh, whatever you submit if we are not in compliance already Okay, good question. So let's say, um, like we said, the recordable incident rate, the safety programs, the experience modification rate, they weren't accepted. What are the next steps that we take? Well, um, we've built really good relationships with the safety professionals at these um, contractor compliance sites. So, I mean, a lot of it has to do with um, relationships. So we build these relationships and when we when we get these documents submitted, we make sure that we are answering and hitting all buttons needed to get that information expedited. Um, and even, um, we usually see about 90, like I said, 96 to 97% accepted as to just building the relationship and working with the other safety professionals on the other side in representation of you. Um, Another one is, do you assist with building safety programs? So yes, absolutely. So we have, our, our risk engineering team focuses a lot on that because there's a lot, I mean, as you can imagine, safety programs that worked three years ago are already out of date. So yes, we put together safety programs. Now, like I said from the presentation, what I recommend is we work specifically with you to design the safety program that you need with the programs that you need and we don't just because yeah we could just throw them together give it to you and you use it but we want to make sure that your employees are in agreement of it they know it and it's specifically fit for you but yes we have all of the resources and we've worked with the um, contractor compliance websites to accept and all of our safety programs are compliant with those websites um another is how long does it take to get approved by the websites so it depends on what you submit, but usually in regards to documentation for the RAVs verification, um, it takes it says it takes up to a week. Now, uh, time frames obviously can vary. If it's you're turning it on a Friday, are you what what's technically a week? Um, but what we do to do our best effort to expedite that process for you is follow up with these contractor compliance companies to get the uh, get get the process expedited. So it is it is possible. Okay, I think that's um, all the time we have. We went over. I don't want to. Uh, I think we just need to wrap it up. So I want to thank you once again, everybody, for attending. And uh, like I said before, this is being recorded, and we will be uh, notifying everybody whenever it's live uh, on our website or on our YouTube channel. And if you have any other questions that you want to follow up with Cam on, please feel free to reach out to him uh, to the information on the screen. And uh, 
thank you once again. Everybody have a good day. If we if we didn't get to any all of the questions, I will uh, follow up with you specifically on any questions that were asked that weren't answered. So thank you everybody for your time. Have a good day.